You're probably familiar with the term AIS, Aquatic Invasive Species. And now, especially since a couple of the lakes in the Wilmer and Kaneohe County area have been designated infested with AIS, we've decided to contact Nick Brown, who is an AIS specialist from the Minnesota DNR. We'll be talking with Nick about what to watch for, what some of the aquatic invasive species are that we have in our area, which lakes are infested, and what we can do to stop the spread of aquatic invasive species. Then we're gonna pay a visit to the Wild Bird Warehouse, a unique place and the first of its kind located right here in Wilmer. After that, we'll ride along again with Rick Reimer of the Soil and Water Conservation District. We're gonna be talking about windbreaks. I'm Nick Brown. I'm the Invasive Species Specialist with the DNR for uh, the Northern District of Region 4 uh, in the state of Minnesota. I'm out of Hutchinson right now. I've been there about three years. I work with local partners on preventing uh, or trying to prevent the spread of invasive species and I work with other local partners on management of invasive species once they get into a water body. Uh, Candy Ohio County is actually in a pretty good spot right now. Uh, we've got a few infested lakes um, with things like curly leaf pond weed, uh, which is a bit more widespread than some of the others, but also Eurasian water milfoil is in a handful of lakes in Candy Ohio County. And just this past summer, uh, we discovered zebra mussels in Green Lake. That's the first uh, infestation of zebra mussels in the area. So while that's in itself not a good thing, uh, what is a good thing that is that it's not more widespread. Uh, I suppose the other good thing is that uh, Candy Ohio County has a really, group, a really good group of dedicated individuals that have come together to try to come up with ideas on how to prevent the spread further. And uh, with uh, a lot of funding behind them, I think they can do a lot of good work. Candy Ohio County is kind of looked at as one of the few counties in Minnesota that's been going at this for more than just the past six months. Uh, it was last July that the legislature gave $10 million to the state, uh, to the different counties throughout the state. And Candy Ohio County fared pretty well in that based on the formula in which those dollars were allocated. But um, before that, they had a really good core group of folks that were, that were interested in, in uh, preventing the spread and battling the, the, the invasive species in the, in the county and in the surrounding areas. Uh, so members of the AIS task force include uh, board members, county board members, county personnel, um, uh, folks from the watershed district, the Middle Fork Crow River Watershed District, uh, the uh, Soil and Water Conservation District, um, other lake users, uh, angler groups are represented on the task force as well as uh, lake associations, the Candy Ohio County, uh, COLA, Coalition, Coalition of Lake Associations is represented too. So it's a really broad spectrum of folks from around the county and these are all people that have been self-educated. They've been, they've been following along with the AIS issues the past, uh, the past few years and these are the folks that are really passionate about what they're doing. Uh, they know a lot and they've got some really good ideas on preventing the spread further within the county. So in Candy Ohio County, uh, what the task force did with uh, this, this funding is they've come up with a plan. Uh, actually they came up with the bulk of the plan a couple of years ago but that was before they had any funding. So the plan was a good plan even a couple of years ago but the funding makes it that much more, well, that much stronger, really. So what they can do now is they can move forward with an expanded inspection program, uh, which has been kind of pieced together. Uh, it's been good over the past couple of years, but I think it's going to be a lot stronger going forward. Um, decontamination, now that uh, Green Lake is infested with zebra mussels, decontamination is going to become more important, and I think the, the folks here in Candy Ohio County have a good idea of where to go with decontamination. They've also got some really great innovative ideas on education. Um, until everybody follows the laws uh, and practices these best management practices, we're not going to stop the spread. Uh, but with better education, we can reach out to those folks who don't understand really what the issue is or how to combat the issue, and uh, that'll help uh, in the long run too. So those are three of the main points that uh, Candy Ohio County is looking to uh, to attack here going forward. The DNR has decontamination units. Uh, what these units are, are essentially big, high pressure, 
hot water systems. So it's just a big hot water pressure washer, uh, just like you would find at a car wash, except our units are mobile and they have heated water. So we can heat the water to 160 degrees so that when it, when it hits the boat, it's 140 degrees. Hot water is effective at killing zebra mussels. High pressure is there to remove unwanted uh, mud or dirt or uh, plants or zebra mussels from the sides of boats. Uh, what makes these units a little bit different than say a car wash other than the hot water is that they're self-contained, they're portable, they're on a trailer, uh, they have their own water system, they recycle, they filter their water and use it over again for, uh, for all the decontaminations. Last summer, uh, folks in Kenny Ohio County might have seen one sitting at the Salisbury Access on Green Lake. Uh, that was a joint effort between the Middle Fork Crow River Watershed District, the City of Spicer, and the Green Lake Property Owners Association. So uh, it, was, it was a great effort. Um, they're going to expand it going forward. Now that Green Lake has zebra mussels, it's more important to, to keep, uh, keep up the fight. Along those lines, now that Green Lake is infested with zebra mussels, DNR is going to be spending more time with our decontamination units there going forward. Um, our decontamination units are used primarily at infested waters that have high use. So places like Mille Lacs, Minnetonka, the Mississippi River, those get a lot of attention from our decontamination units, whereas outstate lakes don't necessarily see that uh, attention. But uh, bad news that Green Lake got zebra mussels. Good news is we're going to see more decontamination unit time from the DNR in Spicer and uh, Kenny High County. Uh, with our our campaigns, we've evolved from clean, drain, dry to clean, drain, dispose. Clean all plants, invasive species, and uh, mud from your boat. Drain all water from your live wells. Uh, that's a, a, another law. Uh, uh, the boat plug and the live wells must be drained before you take your boat down the road. And dispose of any unwanted bait uh, or plants that uh, that might be on your boat in the trash. And if, if we could get all boaters to follow those three those three best management practices or laws, uh, then we could really reduce the, uh, the infestation rate here in Minnesota. Well, back in 2012, there was, uh, or I should back up even farther, um, I believe it was 2011 legislation that said uh, all boats in Minnesota had to have a sticker on them that explained what the invasive species rules were. And some people remember it was a sticker about uh, six, eight inches high. It was silver uh, with black writing on it. Those stickers came out in, oh, maybe March of 2012, and later on in that legislative session, that law stating that those stickers had to be on the boat was repealed. Uh, instead of that law, the legislators came up with a law that said anybody who has a boat trailer or a trailer for water-related equipment in Minnesota has to complete an online AIS education course. So that course is being, uh, being produced right now. Uh, we hope to have it up soon. And uh, there's going to be a fee, not yet sure what that fee is. We hope it's nominal uh, to cover the cost of production of the online course. And we hope that the course is short, 20 to 30 minutes, where, where people who use boats uh, uh, in the state can make sure that they understand what the laws uh, and consequences of AIS in our lakes and rivers are. Hmm. But we don't know because there is an effort to repeal it, right? Yes, that's been, uh, that's been in the news uh, actually for the past few days, but it is uh, gaining traction. Uh, we just have to wait and see. Uh, right now we're continuing as if the, the law is not going to be repealed. The online training is being produced and uh, we're following through with the, with the law as it's written in the books right now. In Minnesota, uh, the DNR has what we call an ambassador program uh, where people can get trained to inspect boats and trained to educate boaters at water accesses uh, and they can do that on their own. They volunteer their time at a, at a lake of their choosing. So uh, that's somewhat popular with uh, people who live on Lake X. They want to see additional inspection hours on that lake so they can volunteer their time, get trained and help educate folks uh, that are launching their boats on their own lake. Uh, beyond that, there could be opportunities uh, to volunteer your time through, uh, through the county efforts now that uh, the county plan is, is going forward, now that the, the county has funding for a bunch of these different programs, I'm sure they'll be welcoming ideas. Uh, they're also going to be granting some of those funds to different, uh, different groups throughout the county that have ideas on how to uh, improve AIS management or uh, education or prevention efforts in their area. So, uh, we hope that'll be, uh, we hope it'll be popular with the lake 
associations, but beyond that, we hope it's popular with everybody in the county. If you need information, you can contact um, uh, somebody at the county, or you can contact me in Hutchinson at 320-234-2550, extension 238, uh, or you can find my information on the DNR website under Invasive Species. Wild Bird Warehouse. Well, I think I think we we're first in the market. I think we we're the first wild bird store in the state of Minnesota. Um, that being said, most wild bird stores handle a lot of trinkets. They handle a lot of wind chimes and stuff really not related to backyard bird feeding. We try to keep our stuff all practical um, so that people can come here to see pretty much everything there's available in the business. Now this is something that you have made, right? Yes, I of course did not make the cages. I just attached the cages to a piece of cedar, uh, gave a little ladder, and then they just hang right on the cages to eat the suet. Lots of people who wouldn't consider buying more than a 10 pound bag will come here and buy a 50 pound bag of all different kinds of feeding products to save money, basically, and we you know, my background was in the livestock feed business, so a lot of uh, our connections are through that business. And so we're able to get very high quality ingredients and we buy enough volume to get really good pricing on them. We do mix um, about a third of our, our mixes actually here, uh, just because of uh, we're able to keep track of the quality a lot better. Um, this particular mix, we mix, here in our store, that's our Cardinal Candy. This mix is our Walters mix. That's one we mix in our store just to keep the quality all the same. Uh, we mix our Finch mix here in the store also. Once again, when we've had, had it subbed out for someone else to mix it, we didn't come out with all the same ingredients that we intended to have in it. Uh, once again, another one mixed in our store. 1120, this morning I had a lady from Delano. I had a couple from Spring Grove, which is in southeastern Minnesota. I had a fellow in from Hutchinson this morning, and then a regular customers that are from this area. They've been a hot seller this morning, and I haven't had a chance to replenish the rack, so. 4874. Probably the main thing to consider is most people want to feed wild birds so they can see them. Um, the wild birds that they want to see are the prettier ones normally, the cardinals, chickadees, nuthatches, but the, the prettier birds. Most of those birds, type of seed you feed, would really say whether you're going to get them or not. Uh, if there's enough uh, cover in your area, most all of the birds already live there. Um, the We'll start with the cardinals. You know, cardinals are generally a ground feeding bird, so some type of a platform feeder. Um, and cardinals are what pretty much everybody wants to attract. They're, the main thing that they're going to eat are oil seeds. Uh, so they don't eat basically any corn or any grain products. All they eat are oil seeds. So you'd want to start with a feeder that is flat like the ground. Uh, hopefully not swinging, but that works too and then with the type of oil seeds that attract them. Once again, the flat eating areas are the ones that attract the widest variety of birds. So most of the feeders, you would want to have a nice flat eating area. Even the hanging feeders, the bigger the flat eating area, probably the more prettier birds it's going to attract. A lot of people like the metal feeders. Once again, a flat eating area. Uh, pretty much the squirrels can't can't get into those and wreck them. A lot of the feeders, even though there's open areas, a lot of the feeders will have a hopper in them so people don't have to fill quite as often. Then once again, the flat eating area, which is what a lot of the prettier birds are into. When you talk about those types, once again, it's the cardinals and uh, morning doves are, are here somewhat in winter, but it's, it's the, the seed eating birds that are here in winter. There are other birds that are here in winter, the goldfinches and so forth, that are, 
you know, more into the smaller seeds, the thistle seed, sunflower chips, and so forth. And those, that's kind of a different class of feeder because it's more of a small seed. A feeder like this is a feeder to feed either safflower or sunflower hearts. Um, a lot of birds like flat eating areas, so we designed it with a flat eating area below the feeder. Uh, a lot of birds like to cling on the metal, but of course the cardinal's not going to do that, but he's going to sit here. A chickadee is going to sit here and probably would just as soon eat out of this rather than the tray. And so when we designed that feeder, which is many years ago, um, it's specifically designed for what the birds like. There's a, there's a lot of feeders that people like, but people don't eat out of them very much. And so when we do a feeder, most of ours are more the practical ones where the idea is to feed birds, not you got to look at them so you can make them look pretty good, but they, they still need to serve their purpose. I think I know most of the very avid birders that are people that really specialize in identification in this area. And most of those people are customers here, but they're the very small percentage of the people who actually feed birds. And so those folks would probably travel, and they do, all across the state just to see a certain bird. Um, in here, I have way more people that come in here that just want to see activity in their backyard. So as far as a, a holy grail of birds in this area, um, for the avid enthusiast or the person who wants to identify them, that's a completely different animal than most of my customers come in here who just want to see cardinals in their backyard and see chickadees up by their windows. snow fence we put in for the Smith family here. And if you want to go down and get a cross-section view of it, and you can see on the outside edge where the snow has been trapped, and that's the intent to kind of trap the snow. Then look at the downwind area here, Dave, too. There's just very little snow, none at all, on the township road. Downwind on the ag land, too. You know, look at, there's no erosion here going across the road. And, you know, these windbreaks act. They, they give multiple benefits out here, multiple benefits. And it's, again, they, if you look at the proximity to the farm site, they couldn't do anything over here anymore be, to protect their site. So they had to actually go onto their agricultural land and take away some of their productive land and then put this windbreak on. But then they got assistance through CRP and through us as cost share assistance. And uh, they've, it's been just a win-win deal for them here. But again, when you get a fetch distance of maybe two miles of un unobstructed wind, you know, before it used to slam right into their farmstead building site. Now, that snow has been all held up out there, and by the time it's hit the evergreens, and like you see here, there's very little snow approaching this township road anymore. See that grass buffer strip there, Dave? But, yep. you know, it's a 
you know otherwise a lot of times they farm right up to the edge of it We'd, we really would like to encourage more buffer strips along these waterway type areas these water courses like ditches and the other thing these windbreaks do they really really will help control drifting even on tile intake so if you got a tile intake it may not put a lot of sediment into it here's a corn row twin corn rows and you can see that it's trapping snow to um, keep this township road clean and it's on the high point that's why it's here because it would cause trouble and the SWCD has a program Dave that we would offer landowners to say hey, if you leave in some wind, uh, corn rows we'll help you offset your cost and then you can still harvest if there's anything available to you to sure. harvest. So the, the inexpensive way to take care of this instead of like doing like the Smiths that is establishing maybe a living snow fence is taking and leaving some corn rows that would be parallel to the roadway. And again they have to be back a certain distance for them to be affected off that road right away. Too close and you've got problems. Too far away it's done what it does but then all of a sudden it would collect the wind and you, it would still continue on down. So the placement of these things is a little purposeful when we're out here. We kind of say this would be ideal for this distance. And it doesn't take much, like I say, to slow this down. That first row, uh, four rows have stopped it out, which you can see nothing in the next row of trees or row of corn at all. But again, and it's a simple, um, effective mechanism that these uh, landowners can do. And again, we would help will pay for that leaving those corn and then again in the spring of the year they can harvest and take what they wish and if anything's available at that time you know the wildlife and deer are going to be pretty hard on them but and a lot of times these can be buried too Dave so you might not have any food value because the snow has filled them all up so it's more of a snow trapment you know again the snow is the big deterrent here we're trying to keep the snow off that road right away minimizing people you know townships or counties from plowing out there which reduce cost to them so the, the uh, fewer times they have to go out back onto these roads the more so you're right Dave really the initial drive was is just to collect the snow um, the erosion is part of it with such a big open wind distance it's going to be part of it but you know it's kind of nice too you can see this snow right here and this dirt will actually melt down and maintain itself here where if this wasn't here this snurt if you will we call it would blow itself into the hot creek and fill the hot creek up with besides the snow that tons and tons of uh, uh, dirt that's on this area uh, as you and I were talking before on a linear windbreak a one foot linear windbreak you know, eight, six, eight foot high is almost 20 tons of soil, or 20 tons of uh, uh, snow. It's just amazing. This is a, <clears throat> well, it's, um, more of a living snow fence. It's parallel to this ditch system that's right here off the road right away of this township road. Uh, the landowner was just saying he, every winter I, the township road would get impassable and it was ice filled and their ditch systems were getting full of snow and they couldn't thaw out properly in the spring of the year and they were backing up water into his fields. So we thought if I could start running twin row shrubs over here I would collect that snow drift which you can see it has which doesn't get transported now any anymore to the ditch system and again he's providing a wildlife corridor for the uh, wild animals to give them sanctuary plus a kind of a travel corridor to go uh, back and forth from some place, you know, it offers them that protection that they like. And again, it's um, it's, it's here for a, he got to put CRP on it. <clears throat> Excuse me. So it's a win-win deal. You can see it's reduced a little bit of erosion again. That would normally be laying in the ditch system there, and it's about 12 years old, 10, 12 years old. <laughs> 